Today on Detroit Muscle, we'll get the fuel delivery decided on our giveaway tribute Trans Am. Learn how to install an EFI system on an old school stroker for big power and reliability. Then we'll give the old Pontiac a leg workout as we rebuild the rear and do a low buck disc brake conversion. Hold on to your cowboy hat and latch on to your CB mic. Our special edition Trans Am Tribute giveaway car rebuild is in full swing. We're taking this 78 TA and reworking it from top to bottom, including a 550 horsepower stroker engine. We also plugged in an overdrive transmission to give her some longer legs and did a complete rebuild on the front suspension and steering components with performance upgrades that are gonna make this thing stick like glue. But we ain't done yet. When she leaves here to go to one of you lucky winners, it's gonna be a tire-eating tribute to the iconic special edition Trans Am that we all remember. Today we're gonna go out back and we're gonna snatch out that factory rear axle and show you guys the basics of a rebuild. And we're gonna upgrade those drum brakes. But before we do all that, we're gonna get started on feeding this 474. Now, carburetors are plenty cool for a bunch of different muscle car applications, but for drivability, performance, and fuel economy, it's hard to beat EFI. We're gonna feed the Pontiac with this new fast, easy EFI 2.0 setup that, well, just like the original is self-tuning, but they added some new features to help it flow more air for better performance, plus it'll support up to 1,200 horsepower. It's a complete system, including a new mini ECU, handheld touchscreen device, O2 sensor, wiring harness all clearly labeled, and of course the heart of the system, the throttle body. The throttle body bolts directly onto a square bore intake flange, and we've got something else to install here too. Now Fast offers this optional throttle bracket that we're gonna be using very sturdy and the real beauty is it allows us to use the stock throttle cable and allows for a lot of adjustability. That means there's no need to spend more money on a custom cable. Using one of their square cable brackets, loosely mounted, we can insert the cable and cinch it down. Then as with any carburetor or throttle body installation, we need to install a throttle return spring. Now there's no denying that this is one stealthy looking unit. At first glance, you can't really find the vacuum ports, but don't worry about it. They still got the ports, whether you're running a thermal vacuum switch or those full throttle hood flaps. You know, most guys I know would rather get a couple of root canals than deal with wiring, and I can't say I blame them too much, but the folks at Fast took that in consideration when they designed this harness with the fewest connections in the market. Whenever wiring up this harness, there are a couple things that you need to keep in mind. They have two heavy gauge wires that are labeled battery positive and battery negative. You want to make sure to run both of these directly to the battery, not splice into the original harness of the car. Because whenever you do that, you're running the chance of getting into some interference or electrical noise. And fighting that issue, man, it can be tough. Speaking of electrical interference, you need to pay attention to your plugs, wires, and other ignition components. Now, if you're running solid core wires and non-resistor plugs, well, sorry, you're gonna have to change them out to avoid that noise. With the conversion that we're doing, we have to run an O2 sensor so that we can monitor the air fuel mixture. The headers that we decided to go with are from Doug's, they're ceramic coated, and it's a full length set of headers. Now, the problem that we run into, we didn't order them with the bungs already installed. But there's no real big issue behind that, but there is a little more science to it than just drilling a hole. First thing you want to consider is the amount of distance between the sensor and the head. You want to allow at least 20 inches of tube because if you don't, well, the exhaust temperatures will be so high that it'll damage the sensor. The next thing, if you're running catalytic converters in this system, you want to make sure the sensor is upstream. Otherwise, if it's behind the cats, well, it's going to be getting a false reading. One last thing, you want to make sure that the sensor is located at least 10 degrees above the horizon. If it's too low, kind of like this, well, the sensor can get moisture in it and damage it. When it comes to the job of getting fuel from the tank to the throttle body we just installed, well, Fast has a couple of options, a return style system and a non-return style. Their non-return or returnless system uses a pump to push fuel from the tank to the engine and uses the ECU to regulate pressure by varying the speed of the pump. 
While the return style also pushes fuel from the tank to the engine, the excess flows through a return line back to the tank. The fuel pressure regulator controls the amount of flow and the PSI of the fuel in the system. We chose a return style system because of the benefits of more accurate pressure and because the flow keeps the fuel cooler. Whenever you install an inline pump like this, make sure you keep it as close to the fuel tank as possible and lower than the tank to avoid any kind of priming issues. Now, FAST offers several different kits for different applications, supporting up to 1,400 horsepower, so I guess we got some room to grow. Still ahead, we do the tail end tango with, with the old TA, showing you how to rebuild a GM C-clip rear end step by step. Also, we'll take a look at a classic Mopar that was built to stick it to Camaros and Mustangs. Like we had mentioned earlier, well, we're going to be rebuilding that rear end and upgrading the brakes. We have some plans for the rear suspension also, but that's going to be a little later down the road. But for now, we've got to get all that stuff out from under it. We'll start by removing the bottom nut from the shocks. Then the U-bolts holding the leaf springs to the rear end can come off. Sway bar is getting replaced, so it can go away completely. With this lower plate removed, we can use the rear end stand and the weight of the car to remove the rear end. Stop, stop. All right. Dropping the springs down and raising the car back up will make it a lot easier to get the rear end out. GM made a train load of these 10 volt rear ends with 8.5 C-clip axles, not only for TAs, but Camaros and well, a lot of other models as well. Now, the gear ratios could have ranged from, well, the mid twos to the mid threes. Now, like the engine, ours could have been swapped out over the years, so we're not really sure what we got here, just that it'll be improved when we're done. Pulling the diff cover off first will expose the differential and allow us to drain out all that stinky old gear oil. Mmm, yummy. Then some persuasion from a hammer and pry bar will help us get the old drums off. This small bolt holds the pin in that keeps your axles in in one of these GM C-clip rear ends. With the pin out, pushing the axles in just a bit makes the clips fall off, then the axles come right out. Before the main caps come off, it's a good idea to stamp which one goes on which side so there's no confusion later on because it does matter. With those gone, we can pull out the big daddy, the carrier. There's a large nut that holds the yoke in place on the front of the unit. A few more hammer taps and the pinion comes out. This pinion bearing is going to be replaced along with the seal that's holding it in. And we're also going to replace these two races as well. The seal and bearing at the end of the axle tubes are going bye-bye. And we'll disconnect the old brake line to allow us to remove the old brakes and the backing plate. Well, we're just about ready to throw in all these parts that we got from Mosier Engineering. Well, we still got to clean up the housing, but that'll be a little later down the road. But let's talk about why all these parts are an upgrade. Now, this is our old stock worn out pause unit, and it uses what's referred to as an S-spring. And this thing commonly cracks, breaks, and causes some pretty severe damage. Whereas our new unit, it's got a total different design and is a far better piece. Our stock yoke is nowhere near strong enough to handle the power we have, so we had to upgrade to this billet steel piece. This thing is strong enough to withstand 750 horsepower. Now our stock axle, it's a 28 spline. We decided to go with a 30 spline. Now the larger diameter spline count, well, it is a stronger axle, but the material this thing's made out of, well, it increases it too. We're at about 50% stronger over the stock one. With the new races, bearing, and seal in place, 
Our pinion is the next piece to get installed. The new yoke can get installed now. And we don't do much plumbing around here, but a pipe wrench is a big help in getting this thing tightened down. The pause unit requires a set of shims on each side of its bearings to position it correctly. There's a certain amount of adjustment that happens here. Well, it can take several tries to get the shims just right. We're at 8,000s on backlash, so we're good to go. These rear end components come with paint that you use to test your pinion and carry your placement. If you spin the pinion and the teeth come around looking like this. Yep, that's what you don't want. That's too shallow. We're gonna have to go a little deeper. You have to make adjustments so that there's more meshing between them. If they look like this, you're in good shape. Stick around and catch a gander at the Mopar pony car that was built to square off with the likes of the Boss Mustang. Then we'll show you how to slap rear disc brakes on your second gen F body without breaking the bank. Detroit Muscle salutes the 1970 Dodge Challenger TA. Never mind fancy engineering and plush interiors. Mopar Muscle meant three things. Cubes, horsepower, and acceleration. Mopar no car. <laughs> Loud, proud, and in your face. A bodies with cool names like Dark Demon and Duster. On the B side, Roadrunners and Chargers. Both serious pink slip performers. <laughs> The C's and D's were the land yachts, the Newports, and the Sport Furies. But in 1970, Dodge introduced the E-Body, a pony car platform designed to take down the Mustangs and the Camaros. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to our little friend, the Challenger TA. When I'm idling and I'm starting to go, when I feel the outboard carburetors kick in, it's like dropping a hammer. It's all over from there. It's just the world becomes a blur. Heart starts pumping. It's a rush. The heartbeat of this beast was the only engine offered, the gutsy 346 pack. This lightweight, torquey V8 embarrassed many big block counterparts. Underneath the oval air cleaner were three two barrel holly carbs sitting on a high rise Edelbrock aluminum intake. Air was inducted through this suitcase size hood scoop, raised an inch above the hood, giving it better airflow. 290 horsepower rating was an understatement. It was more like 350. The car weighed about 3,600 pounds and at the drag strip clocked ETs of 14.3 seconds in the quarter mile. In full stock form, the TA produced a zero to 60 time in just under six seconds. Three top three finishes on the Trans Am circuit wasn't good enough. And the Challenger TA didn't meet expectations in the showroom either. Less than 2,400 were ordered mainly due to the steep price tag, a thousand bucks extra for this two letter package. Those who forked out the cash got front and rear spoilers, a racing style gas cap, beefier leaf springs to accommodate bigger tires inside exhaust, a Hearst pistol grip shifter, rally gauges, and bucket seats rounded out the cockpit. When I first saw it, it was a car that like I'd not seen before and I knew I wanted it. John Grant bought this numbers matching Challenger back in 75 and had it fully restored a few years back. No clone here, proven by the fender tag stamped Trans Am. And what really caught my eye about this car was the uniqueness of it, the hood scoop, the paint scheme, the stripes. It's an awesome car to look at and, and as well to drive. If you can find one in a junkyard, expect to pay big bucks for a Challenger. 70 to 74 were the only production years. A lot of guys drop in Hemis, add custom spoilers, and upgrade the suspension with pro touring packages, turning Detroit iron into modern handling street machines. So what is it about these classic Mopars? He didn't drive a Challenger, but Bo Duke, to this day, has some advice for any single guy out there in love with a Mopar badge. If you can find a girl that drives an RV towing a Mopar of any kind, marry her. Coming up, we'll finish our rear end rebuild.
After Tom got finished rebuilding our 8.5 rear end, we went ahead and did a rear drum to disc brake conversion. Now, this is a real budget friendly project you might want to take on yourself, and it all starts with a junkyard backing plate from a 98 to 02 Camaro. And from there, you can use more used parts or some you find off the shelf at the parts store. Best part is it's a both on project with little or no fabrication, and here's how you do it. Now you will have to make some sort of eighth inch space there like we made out of aluminum and it goes right in front of that Camaro backing plate we got from the junkyard. Now we can go ahead and grab the axle and being careful not to damage the seal, slide it into place. Then a magnet makes it easy to insert the C-clip and pulling the axle back out holds it in place. Some Loctite thread locker on the pin locking bolt will ensure that these components stay where they're supposed to be. I put plenty on. Well, finally we get to bolt on this Mosier differential cover. Now here's a very important point. Make sure you back off these load bolts before you put this thing on. Otherwise, you could cause serious damage to your cover. Torque specs on these bolts are 25 foot-pounds. Torque spec on these guys, though, is just five foot-pounds. Black jam nuts, 10 foot pounds. Now for the home stretch. The rotors go on easy as pie, and these are the ones that would fit those 98 to 02 Camaros. Same goes for the calipers and the brake pads. These pads are the EBC yellow stuff units, which are the same that we opted for on the front brake. And that's how you do it drums to disc. Well, the only thing we need to do now is put in the lubricant, but whatever you use, make sure that it's got the limited slip additive in it. Oh yeah, nothing like those additives. The older you get, the more you need them. What? You can keep that. Well, flat black is back and badder than ever, especially when it comes to decorating your 65 to 79 small block Chevy. Mr. Gasket has put together some of the most common engine dress up items to quickly give yours better looks, including flat black valve covers with gaskets, of course, a push on breather, flat black dipstick, timing tab, and of course, timing chain cover. It's truly a budget friendly way to decorate your bow tie mouse for less than 85 bucks. Annoying heat and noise can ruin the ride in your street machine any day of the week, but you can spray yourself back to happiness with Lizard Skin Special Coatings and Spray Kit. Lizard Skin Sound Control is ideal for reducing exterior noise and enhancing sound systems. Their ceramic insulation creates a thermal barrier that reduces interior heat 30 degrees or more. The Super Pro Kit is made exclusively for the thick viscosity that their coatings have, and it comes with everything for application, so you can have yourself a cooler, quieter ride. We like new and old muscle cars around this place, and here's something for your 05 and newer GM LS engine. This Excel Supercoil pack features silicone magnetic steel cores, plus optimized winding, resistance, and turn ratios to deliver 10 to 15% more energy than OEMs. Plus, they use a high temp epoxy that resists shock and vibration. So you can upgrade your LS engine with a set of eight for about 393 bucks and hope you get set for another Detroit Muscle next time.